Hello and welcome to the Posta Dojo podcast. My name is Sam Miller and I'll be your host on this postural transformation journey, sharing some stories from my own journey of healing and correcting a structural 85 degree hyperkyphosis and scoliosis, as well as speaking with experts from a variety of fields, some that you might expect and some that you might not expect. Today, I'm excited to have Agnes on the podcast, who is also an integrative, holistic scoliosis healer as well. Agnes, how do you describe what you do with with the posture? So I look at it from nutritional standpoint point, point of view. I look at it from emotional standpoint of view and from our brain and ability of our brain to generate the pain. My own healing journey was that I was in a lot of chronic pain post my post having spinal fusion surgery. And through the medical system, through all the different practitioners I've seen, I had to figure it out a way to heal and get out of the pain. It's a common experience to be diagnosed with scoliosis. They look at the curvature and they'll either suggest bracing or surgery to address that curvature and then you'll either get bracing or surgery and that works or doesn't work or it happens or it doesn't happen and then you're on your own after that or beyond that really. Sometimes you'll find a, a surgeon who is more familiar with scoliosis and they, they have some physios that they work with, they have other practitioners that they refer you to but I'd say for most people they're really left on their own. Where has your a journey taken you to take this healing uh, onto yourself? Yeah, I was diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 15. I was, ba- it was back in Poland. I was in a living in a very small city. There was no one else who was, who had scoliosis. It wasn't heard of, and it. I was advised at that time that if I start, if even if I try bracing within a year, I will still have to do the spinal fusion surgery. So this was early 90s. Back in Poland, no internet, no better way of knowing can I do anything by myself or can I can I support my body any other way. I've had three kids since and I've worked in a corporate world, so I haven't really taken care of my body or my spine for most of my adult life until I got to the point where I wasn't able to move and I ended up with um, such a debilitating pain that I was in bed on very strong meds that weren't helping me. And after a week of being in this depression-like state from trying another, another medication, I just started thinking that there must be a better way. There has to be something else. And in desperation, I did started looking on the internet, researching and Googling and looking. At that time, I was looking for different practitioners, trying to find someone who can help me because I really didn't envision being in early 40s to live rest of my life in bed or the alternative that was given to me was a full spinal fusion surgery from neck to pelvis. My search through the solutions, through the practitioners, led me to finding therapists that specialize in scoliosis, but that journey was still taking such a long time that I felt like I had to do a little bit on my end. So I started looking at nutrition, minerals, uh, hormones for women, because I could see that connection between the pain level and even like the core engagement on a monthly basis and my monthly cycle. And that have helped me. Uh, that have helped me a bit, but it wasn't a full solution. Like I was, I was still dealing with pain flare-ups on a regular basis. So that really led me to the pain reprocessing therapy and looking at the brain's role when when we're dealing with chronic pain. So for somebody who's who has who may have some childhood trauma, who have may have some trauma experiences in youth, or even. It's as simple as the perceived stress we deal with through the days. For me, because I spent so much time in a physical therapy, I was just oversensitized. I was told you can sit certain weight, way, not 
the way you want to say it. You have to watch how you walk. It got to the point that I was afraid of walking because I was overanalyzing every single step, thinking, is my glute engaged? Is my core engaged? Am I hurting myself by walking? So I had to do a lot of pain reprocessing therapy, just taking away that pain, lowering that danger signal in my brain. So I had that ability to really trust my body, that it knows how to walk, it, the movement I'm doing are supportive. And then subsequently, I, I start st strength tr training, which I'm benefiting a lot, like I'm really enjoying. I have never been a person that worked out on a regular basis before. As I mentioned, I really didn't take care of my body or my scoliosis before, but taking away that pain where I was afraid of the movement enabled me to actually move every day in a way that is supportive, in a way that I'm like enjoying and I'm loving doing it every day. Do you think the source of your chronic pain was from some of the structural issues that were happening with the scoliosis, or was it more from the, the results of the, the fusion surgery? So I never had any pain before my fusion surgery. And my pain really started about 10 years post-fusion surgery. I was in two car accidents in my 20s and in two car accidents in my late 30s, early 40s. So on a medical, if I do have medical records, like when I go on the scan and what doctors told me, the pain was from pinched nerve. It's from the fusion, the spine collapsing under the fusion. It's from arthritis in the lower back, from disc degenerations. All these labels are mentioned on the reports. The way I really approached this was from like a mind-body perspective. When I focused on just the structural issues that I have, because I still have scoliosis, I still have fusion, that could, that's a great justification for the pain I have. But when I worked with that concept, I just, I wasn't healing. I required a lot of drugs. I was spending a lot of resources. Like I was in a physical therapy at 1.5 times a week where there wasn't any improvement in my like pain levels. So I really approached that from that mind-body perspective and looking at, am I just oversensitive to all the stimulus and all the information coming at me? And can I lower that danger signal so then I can actually move and do the training that I need to do that my body needs for scoliosis? So I, I, I live with the, the definition of pain being mm -hmm. pay attention, integrate now. Mm -hmm. When that speaks to the journey that mm -hmm. pain requires mm -hmm. uh, me to go down. First, understanding what that is, understanding in what conditions it's created, mm -hmm. and then integrating that. So sometimes mm -hmm. that integration is going into it and feeling it yep. and... I guess that's where that what you're describing as pain, okay. sorry, pain reprocessing. Yes, exactly. So I'm curious, how do you define and approach pains as they arise in your mm -hmm. body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I loved what you just said. It's exactly that's the same principle. We speak about different, let's say, concept, but we can. It's exactly the same. So part of the so part of pain reprocessing, it's really tuning into your body and listening and observing the sensations as they come in. And those sensations for some of us might be pain, for some of us maybe anxiety or depression. So it's really about observing what's happening, tuning into the body and understanding that there's really nothing wrong structurally with our body. And I know it's a hard concept to grasp. Like I still have scoliosis, but from a pain perspective, it's almost like I'm putting that label on the side because it's not serving me with what I want to do with my body. If I focus on that label, you and I'm sure there's people who have scoliosis, they don't deal with pain. And for them, that label brings, their mind is very clear about it. It's a clean slate for me because of the years I spent in the physical therapy and to the extent where, you know, if I, when I was reaching for a coffee mug from a shelf, 
and I was in pain. That pain would have been justified because I had scoliosis. And because I was in so much pain, I couldn't actually do the movement that was helpful for me, right? So it's like this, it's in pain reprocessing, we're really looking at that fear and pain cycle. When you are fearful of the movement, that's going to contribute to the pain. That pain will drive the fear. And that fear, again, will amplify the pain. So it's really about breaking that cycle versus staying within it. I hope I answered. And yeah, and so walk us through that. How would you approach that? Yeah. Uh, like maybe with an example of a common type of pain, maybe a yeah. lower back pain. How yeah. would you walk? Yeah, for sure. So I actually love lower back pain because <laughs> that's something I have. <laughs> And so usually it depends, it really depends if, if my client has diagnosis of herniated disc or a press or a compressed risk, we actually have an evidence of pain reprocessing therapy as an approach that works wonderfully for compressed herniated discs. So part of the process is really psychoeducation, understanding that our brain can generate any symptom in our body. And I walk clients through it. So for some clients, that psychoeducation, they can relate to it right away. For some, it's a longer lesson. Part of what we also do is lowering that danger signal. And we do that through the somatic tracking. So really, like you've mentioned, tuning into our body, listening, observing, understanding what our body is telling to us. We live in such a busy world. All of us are, and I know I've been there. It took me years to get and tune in into my body. Like I didn't even know 10 years ago this was a possibility or 20. The other piece really is sending ourselves the safety signals. So for me, when I was in my journey, that really was very simple. I kept repeating to myself, I am safe as I read, as I practiced the breathing. So really diaphragmic breathing and recalibrating that nervous system through the breathing. All of us can do this all the time. And I see you doing that as we actually are speaking. I think it's like a lost art of breathing in and breathing out through the nose. And there's a lot of amazing breathwork practices, but you know, unless we are really calibrated and that nervous is calibrated where it's, it's staying and we can stretch it out as things happen, I find that as we bring in the breath work, where it's more focused on even exhaling through the mouth, it's when we really are can engage our, our chest and our trigger our nervous system. So it's pretty simple. It's the three steps are really re-education around the pain psychology, bringing the messages of safety. And I love incorporating the breath work, breathing in and breathing out through the nose at that point, as well as the somatic tracking. And for different people, different messages of safety work. Not everybody can relate to I am safe. For some people, it might be just this is temporary. I'm on a healing journey that may bring them a lot of peace. I think all of us intuitively know what brings us peace. And the solution is very simple. It's really within all of us. It's just in the busyness of our days and our lives, we just, we don't take enough time to turn in and listen to our own wisdom. The Hawaiian prayer, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. It runs through various options because it may be I am safe it may be I trust it may be something around forgiveness it may be something about around strength around healing for each person depending on the the type of energy of the trauma the reflection the opposite of that will be different for different people as well searching as you go into these places as you start paying attention as you start listening as you start going into especially some of these positions that allow you to feel and become aware of what that limit is and what that fear is, even, yeah, without defining it as pain. Because pain, if we say, I have pain here, I'm feeling this pain, you're immediately pro programming yourself as the victim of yes. that thing, that external thing, as opposed to saying, I, have a, I, have, I, I feel tightness here. I'm experiencing 
an aching here. I'm, I'm experiencing a tension here. Now that, that's programming you as part of the process. It's programming you as part of this experience that's happening. And when you're approaching it from that role, that position, then you can start exploring and then you can start reprogramming. What if I inhale? What if I become relaxed here? What if I breathe trust or breathe strength or breathe relaxation or breathe forgiveness into this area and observe what happens? You, you, and that's where this psychosomatic process comes into it, connecting that mind-body connection. And I've personally had profound experiences in, the, in, these, in these moments. And this isn't just when I'm like in pain and doing this will happen during the regular exercises and workouts that I'm doing. Right now, the horse dance for me is an incredible pose for me to open up the hips and similar to a sumo squat, really wide-legged. And as I go deeper into the, that deep part of the range, I get that restriction and that tightness. And to go deeper, I have to relax. But as I relax, I feel the fear of losing my balance. And essentially, the tightness is there to maintain my body. It's been there because I have that imbalance in my spine, so I'm holding on, but I have to let that go to go deeper into that stance. So to approach that with using assistance with my hands, I was doing it in the pool so I could do it underwater and make it an easier process. I wasn't gonna fall over and, and injure myself. Uh, I'm able to do it in a safe environment. I'm creating that physical safety as well as that program safety from the mind and releasing the energy of that painful tightness, that compensated strength is profoundly healing because then I can reprogram my range of motion. I can establish comfort and strength through that range of motion that I may have been neglecting chronically for many years, which can house that tension and obstructions in our flow and cause this kind of discomfort that we might be experiencing. And I'm nodding because I can relate to everything. When I started my stand, uh, strength training last year, I actually had to do that pain reprocessing work on myself. I was pain-free. There was no pain getting into my whatever my coach assigned to me for that day. But there were exercises where in the past, I knew I would have a flare-up after. So my brain automatically would go in, oh, can you do this? Will you be able to walk tomorrow? And I had to do that work as I did the movement and allow whatever was coming through, just come through. Send my, I, did, I still send myself those messages of safety. And I just, I knew the movement is good for me. Like it, I wouldn't receive it in my program if it wasn't, if I wasn't ready for it. A brain is amazing. It remembers and it codes everything that happened in our life and can bring those experiences into the future. Maybe we're not exactly in the same situation. It might be similar, um, but it is amazing. I have another example. When I was, when I was dealing in the chronic pain, I did a Tai Chi maybe four years ago, and I'm just back with the same instructor because she's amazing. And I'm looking at the practice totally differently, just like you've mentioned. So it's amazing when we when we in that pain and how that constrains us, how especially for somebody like I was in 15 years in pain, a lot of my clients are three, four decades in pain. That pain becomes your identity. It's so hard for us to tune in and even use the breathing as a safe way because we have that, it's almost like we are clouded by that pain. We don't see things the way they are. And soon as you know, that switch happens and we can tune in, we can feel the emotions, we can, we can feel the even limiting beliefs as they come up and we can actually see them for what they are and we can do that work or additional work that's required. And it's work that can happen on a deeper level as we practice this, as we start tuning into our bodies at this level. I had a similar experience with, with Tai Chi. Years ago, I would look at that and be like, no, that's way too subtle. I've got, I've got some serious musculoskeletal imbalances. What is this light, slow movement going to do? It's too subtle. It's not effective enough. I need the force to really get in here and, and correct. But the force is 
is nothing without the allowance and the acceptance and the surrendering into safety at a very deep level that's going to allow that alignment to happen. Um, and when we look at healing, those three components are so important. It's that allowance. It's that self-compassion. It's that letting things happen as they as they meant to happen in our body because our bodies will process. They're amazing when it comes to that. So I love that you've mentioned that. Yeah, and you did mention earlier as well, like the the breathing. I do want to invite everyone when they're listening to this this podcast as well to to focus or I, I don't know about focusing. It's a lack of focus, but it's also just about becoming a a slower breath becoming five five seconds in five seconds out is a great benchmark i think yes. that's a great benchmark for people to start slowing down nasal breathing if you're slowing down your breath through your nose at that rate you're on a you're on the right direction anything less than that yes. it's worth practicing and bringing that awareness so it becomes a new default you're just speaking to my heart yes and so you also mentioned the labels that we apply Mm-hmm. That's certainly something I agree with, and I don't. I again don't program. I, here's the thing: I, I don't program myself and think about, oh, I have scoliosis. I'm trying to fix my scoliosis. But in order for me to communicate with people online and create a hook to people who are who have this condition, I kind of I, I have to use words that they'll understand. Um, so how do you approach that? Because And same you know, here, just so you know, I feel the same way. So for me, it's when I'm looking at the label, it's basically I'm looking back at my own history and what I've heard at the medical field and the explanations for the pain and then being able to, being afraid to move the body, being afraid to walk, to sit, being afraid to grab a mug from the shelf because the pain will be there because my ribs are not turning properly or my pelvis is rotating and this is why when I'm walking I'm wobbling and I'm not disputing I'm so much stronger my posture is so much better through through the movement and through the practice I have I think when we are dealing with highly sensitive people and a nervous system that's already dysregulated we're just letting and and we without having that pain reprocessing or that explanation behind the brain and how easy it is for our brain to hijack those ideas and make those stories bigger than they are i think we're just doing a little bit of disservice because i think if we just did a little bit of mind body approach where we all understand how how we connect and how we can work from the top to the bottom and from the bottom up. So through the somatic tracking, through the breathing, how our stress impacts us, how those labels can be stressful as well. Because when we receive that diagnosis, it can seem to be very scary. And if you've been in a surgery, in a spine surgery, and I talked to a lot of people and they had spine surgery when they were 9, 10, 12. I had mine when I was 16. Back then I was away for six months from home. It's a bit different now, but still we are in a hospital setting that it's really not conducive for really healing at a deeper level for healing the nervous system. And when we when we look at what's in our back, how when we hear the different labels, when we hear and it's I, I don't want to categorize as black and white because that is also not the way that will serve anybody. I think we can be in that gray area where we can serve people just a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, the similar way is the smell of home-baked cookies might take yeah. us back to our grandmother's house. The, the mention of those mm-hmm. words can take someone back to that emotional state they were in, mm-hmm. uh, as well as that kind of fairly traumatic uh, kind of process mm-hmm. of, of kind of dealing with mm-hmm. a diagnosis like that. So it is... And I do want to add, you know, like, at being 16, when I was diagnosed, I never dealt with pain until 10 years after. The other thing that we know about the brain is we may ignore or we may not even feel like we impacted by the trauma or a big it doesn't have to be trauma it can be just a significant experience in our life right but if we don't process and i don't think we are taught how to process things as they happen in our life unless we've done this work like me and you 
for a while, um, that stays in our body as a memory, right? You know, with time as other things happen, so for me, I just, I was burned out from my work, it was quite stressful. That's where everything came at me with my chronic pain journey. So I, I think, I know with my own kids, I do a lot of this work that I do with my clients, not to the same extent because they're just kids, but a lot of somatic tracking, a lot of breathing through the nose, breathing out through the nose, tuning into their nervous system so they understand and they can pick up on the signals that their body is sending to them. I like to say our body whispers to us until it yells because we haven't listened and there's so many whispers but we just keep missing them that's my experience with my clients with myself because we're just not taught how to listen and how to pick up on them and how to allow body to do and process things as they happen how, how would you describe that process of listening to those whispers yeah. to a nine-year-old <laughs> it's Perfect question, because I work with a nine-year-old at home. <laughs> we end of the day, what we do is, so we do a couple of things. Obviously, I do the breathing with her, breathing education. So I tune in every evening and I ask her, are you breathing through your tummy? Are you breathing through it? And she's a really good quick learner. So she already knows some exercises that will help her with nose breathing. But she's also at the age for girls where in grade three, that shift can happen from actually engaging the diaphragm for breathing to engaging the chest. And that really is a function for girls just of growing up and observing the world around them, being separate from everybody else they take stress a little bit differently as well. They're growing up. The other thing and, that... And that, that age, that yeah. seven to nine years old yeah. is really when we're, we're our, sure. our brain waves are starting to enter into the more, the less imaginative frequency. Yes, it is. So I, this is why like I'm so passionate as much as my clients are all their clients, but working with the families that have kids, because really the impact is not just on my client, but then on the whole family, they can bring that work into their home. So the other thing I do with her is the breathing, the tummy breathing. I'm like, check on your your tummy. Are you breathing through the nose? Where is your tongue at? Is it on the pillows, on the roof of your mouth? And then I, we do usually one to two minute meditation and I, it's nothing overly complicated. It's a story I made out about little piggy living in a barn, but through that, she knows how to engage and how to listen in because I also, I went through my healing journey when she was a toddler and I talk openly with all of my kids and my husband like this is passion of mine this is something I went through so they hear me talking about it all the time they are very tuned in so like we and and I listen to to her as well so for example she woke up today in the morning and she told me my legs are hurting my arms are hurting I think I'm feeling just like the way I felt last time I was getting sick so I trust her assessment. Like she has no fever. She has no, like she has no other visible symptoms to me that could tell me she's getting sick for me to, for her to stay home. But it's really also about that trust and allowing her to trust her body and giving her that time that she needs to recover or rest or relax versus old me 20 years ago would probably check my child fever and you good you can go to school the mind body connection the yeah. the approach that i that i work with as well as that psychosomatic the psyche the mind and the, the somatic the body and you've mentioned somatic tracking what is that process what are you referring to with somatic tracking yeah, so it's really tuning in into your body. So I incorporated the breathing in and breathing out through the nose as we do it in, but it's really staying quiet, observing the symptoms. It's almost like your body is doing this fireworks just for you inside your body. Whether you deal with anxiety, pain, stress, pinching, stabbing, 
whatever your symptoms are, really tuning in and observing and breathing, incorporating that breathing in. And part of that somatic tracking practice is really sending those messages of safety or like even listening to a meditation. I love to record for my clients actual somatic tracking meditations where that helps them tune in into the body, observe the sensations. Sometimes there's a light humor incorporated in those as well, because sometimes or often when we're in chronic pain, we track those sensations with a high intensity. So we want to bring a little bit of lightness into that as well. But it's really tuning into your, your body and listening, observing, Yeah, I mean, if you're able to laugh and enjoy, then that's a sign that your nervous system is relaxed, right? Yes, it is. It is. I, a lot of my clients are ladies that are 65 plus that have had chronic pain for 20, 30 years. So a lot of it, it's around, again, that self-compassion, slowing down, tuning in. And just, it could be as simple as just really breathing in through the nose, breathing out through the nose. And can I feel that breath as I'm doing that practice? And I can see you doing that right now at the moment, which I think it's wonderful. I think a lot of us deal in with so much stress. And if we incorporate that one to two minutes at the beginning into our day, and then bring it more, it actually will help us through the nervous system, through any symptoms we're feeling. I find it's such an accessible and easy practice and it's free, anybody can incorporate it. How do you define your relationship with gravity at the moment? With gravity? (laughs) I never thought about that. (laughs) I consider each breath is a negotiation with gravity. How do we, how much do we surrender and accept it? Or how much do we, are we resisting it? I think the, for for me, I define my relationship with gravity as a constant renegotiation. Every breath I have, I do have a opportunity to breathe differently, to breathe, to breathe more lightness, to breathe more alignment, to breathe more safety, more relaxation. There's always, depending on how I'm whatever my state is, whatever, whichever day or whatever I'm doing that day, there's always an opportunity to just to renegotiate. I feel like I I do have a constant renegotiation and 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 my path, my North Star is, is of acceptance and lightness and allowance. And and that leads to that elongated alignment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, it would be definitely the ease and lightness at the moment. And I felt like that for the last I want to say year maybe year and a half just because I also feel like I've done this practice and especially breathing I I love that aspect of my practice and I feel like it's so underrated too just like understanding the brain's role I think these are such a simple tools we can implement it in our daily lives I feel like I became at the moment it will may sound a little bit funny i feel like i'm one with bread at the moment because it's such a easy practice i don't have to think about it anymore it's very effortless for me it's very easy for me to tune into my body does that mean it's practice it's perfect all the time no So I just want to speak about that too, because a lot of people with chronic pain, we have this idea that it's black and white. It has to be, it's all or nothing. And as you said, where you renegotiate every day, I do have times where it's like wonderful flow and ease and nothing's happening in my life. And of course, I'm one with bread. But I have days where it's not as easy, where my nervous system is challenged. I'm still one with breath, but that's just because I've done, I've invested in my practices ahead of time. Practices, yes. You've made effort and practice, yeah. and that, that increases the amount of time that you can enjoy effortlessness. Yeah. 
Yes, totally. So even when it comes to breathing, it's when we try to switch from mouth breathing to the nose breathing, it's a new habit. Our neural pathways still have to be rewired. We do have to do a little bit of reprocessing. Same way when we look at the brain education or any other healthy habit we want to do, we still have to do a bit of work for it to become part of us where it's really effortless and easy. Now you've had fusion surgery and you've gone through three pregnancies with that fusion surgery. What what advice would you have someone for someone who's maybe approaching the same situation, whether whether they've had surgery or not, someone's they may have an extra curve in their spine. How would you advising for people who might be considering going through that pregnancy? So I had three pregnancies, all three were different because I had one in my 20s, so my body was still never dealt with pain. And in the 20s, you pretty much can do anything you want to do. I had one in my 30s and I had one in my early 40s. So as you can imagine, wild range. Mm -hmm. What I have learned from especially my second and my third one was actually the mind-body connection. I didn't think about that while back then, about as a mind and body connection. But looking back at it, I've done uh, hypnobirding. I've done a lot of meditation. I had private yoga that was focusing just on supporting my body. I've done a lot of mindset work around it. So my advice would be just take it easy. I know you can do it. I've done it. There's so many people. Actually, if somebody has questions, I'm happy to connect them with a few other resources, a few other ladies that are actually in the space with scoliosis and pregnancies. It seems scary. I've been told not to have kids. I've been told it's going to be like end of the world for my spine and my fusion when I have kids. One of my kids was... Yeah, I've also heard that. And I have a feeling that's from doctors who may have seen someone go through, maybe they've had some type of scoliosis, they've gone through pregnancy without this understanding of the breath and our ability to activate and engage in a healthier way and, and provide support and activation where our body needs to with these types of postural compromises. And I feel like they've seen people go through it without that information and maybe progress the curve. And so now they're giving the advice, no, if you get if you get pregnant, you're going to progress your curve. And it's, okay, maybe that's not, maybe that's not accurate if you have the right information and techniques. Yeah. And the one thing I do want to add, as much as internet is amazing for connecting with people like you or me or some other specialist, it you can also get into that rabbit hole of the very dark, how it's it's horrible and difficult and all these other stories that it's easy for our brain. We are developmentally, our brain is set up so it will always choose the negative information. It will always choose the worst case scenario to prepare us in advance of what might be happening. So my advice would be just finding finding information and finding people that bring that you can connect with that bring lightness to your body as you're reading their story that are very maybe objective or neutral at least versus getting that information um, that may actually trigger you you may start worried and because it's so easy for us to add to those stories take somebody else's story almost feel like that may happen to us too because there's so many resources, there's so many ways that we can now incorporate the either mind-body practices, relaxation practices, and there's so much information available that can be really supportive to somebody going and being pregnant. Yeah, it's our brains might have a difficult time separating that one story, that one negative story from the 99 positive stories. We listen to both sides and oh, there's an equal kind of weight in our mind, but you know, the things we pay attention to, once again, are, are really important. And there's really most of the value is going to come by paying attention to the positive things. And so what type of, what are people coming to you with? And, and what people are you seeking to, to help on their journey? Yeah. So my clients come to me with chronic pain. All my clients come with chronic pain. I have clients with scoliosis. I have clients with spinal fusion. And I have clients with no 
scoliosis and no, final, no spinal fusion. But for example, herniated disc, fibromyalgia, um, disc work, the mind-body work can be applied universally. I have a client right now who's post-cancer treatment and she's thinking um, about using mind-body just as a relaxation technique and really getting in tune with her body. Yeah, so it's amazing. Like, I love it. I'm passionate about the scoliosis just because for me it was such a big story that scoliosis equals pain. And I see this happening so often where people associate having scoliosis means pain. But I also have seen a lot of people who have scoliosis and they're so strong. They can, like you, so many things and others that those two, it doesn't mean that scoliosis you know, means pain or debilitating or chronic pain, but it's still a story that's being told to a lot of my clients. Usain Bolt, the fastest man on the planet, with I think he has a forty had a forty degree scoliosis. Yep. The spines are springs, and some have extra curves than others. And each person uh, has the ability to start perceiving their spine in in healthy ways, understanding how it is instead of trying to to hold and think how it should be and getting maybe upset or depressed or compensated because they're trying to do something that the spine may not be designed to to do so the first step on this process is letting go of those older ideas those older holding patterns that that may need to get out of the way we need may need to go back we need to take a step back literally sometimes and understand where we need to start this journey from and for each person is different and the stories we tell along the way are going to determine your success most of the time and you have the power to tell that story and I think the, the greatest tragedy of, of most people in this situation is that they've been made believe that they don't have that power that the person in the lab coat and the big in the big hospital is the person who knows everything and is the only person who can help you or not. And if they don't help you, then you've got to live with it. And that's one of the most dangerous stories that I've seen commonly with people with these types of structural compromises. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I love that you mentioned that because like part of the work that I do with my clients is really regaining that agency over their own body, understanding the power they have. And you, once we work with our brain or whatever we want to call mind body, whatever we want to call mindset, we have actually so many, once, once we know how to apply the work, we can move our body in a way that feels free to us. And what, what a way that could be. To be strong. When I was in my healing journey, we threw away the skates. I used to skate with my kids. I was the one teaching my two other kids skating. We threw them away because I never thought being in the pain I was, I will skate again. No way. And I returned to skating and that was such a freeing experience for me to be skating again. And I know if I went to any of my therapists or doctors and I've told them I'm back to skating, it's just not existing in that universe, right? We've uh, mentioned some of them, but let's recap. What are the practices to develop agency, to empower yourself to heal? Mm -hmm. So for me, it really starts into tuning into our body, right? Very simple. The breath would be the one of the simplest things anyone can do. The somatic tracking, tuning into sensations, how does it feel, how your body feels, scanning the body. Being able to actually take the time and rest, that's another big one for a lot of my clients. They think we have to produce and be on the go. Being okay and then from being okay to actually learning how to appreciate and then how to enjoy the rest is as well a key lesson, which people don't think, oh, I want to gain agency. How is the rest essential? It is essential. And really understanding what are our needs, self-compassion. We've mentioned the self-compassion, building the team, looking at the team you want to have, whether that's a coach or whether that's a support system, someone that you can look up to that's way ahead of you. That can help you as well, right? Because I also find it's hard for us sometimes when we've been 
in that box with chronic pain to actually see things be beyond the box and how would that look like for us so gaining that agency back part of that work is really what do i want how do i want things to look like what's really important to me and understanding those three just for you right i find that if people have that story of their why then that's it's easier coming back to that agency as well as if they know their beliefs and what's really what are they what's really important to them and whether that's the freedom of movement you've mentioned that victim mode that's a big part as well just understanding how that plays in for for somebody who's been living with pain for 23 years it's we it's almost like that person is defined by it, the pain so letting go of those definitions practicing these things that you've mentioned and then one of and then resting which i think yeah doesn't get a, get as much attention as it is needed because once we've done the work or you've you've built that new posture if you're holding that with tension and effort it, it it may not be fully integrated right so when you're in a state of rest and you're effortlessly holding these postures when you're relaxing it's during those relaxation moments that i i truly think that integration is happening it's when you've truly accepted and you've been grateful for the work you've done those are some of the most profound healing moments. So it's doing the work, but also doing the rest. So Agnes, thank you very much for sharing your perspective. I appreciate you for the work that you're doing. And, and, it, and it sounds like you've, you're really honing in on chronic pain and how to approach that. How do you work with people and where can they find you? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram at The Simple Beautiful Wellness. That's probably the easiest or my website, thesimplebeautifulwellness.com. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one.